Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started because we've got a, a very, very packed, uh, uh, packed uh, uh, show today. Uh, I want to start off, Nola's uh, uh, sort of taken, you know, uh, mostly in charge of the uh, upcom our upcoming closure bridge. Uh, we're having a hack day this weekend. She wants to tell you a little bit about closure bridge, a little bit about a hack day. Hopefully, you'll be able to come out and help us, you know, improve the content and you know make our class, you know, make the class uh, really uh, nice. But uh, I'll let her come up, and she's going to just take five or ten minutes to tell you a little bit about it and uh, get you uh, get everybody motivated to come out and uh, make this happen. Line to my presentation. No, <laughs> it's, it's just monitor. that TV. That one's fine. Over just on that side. side. Right, look at that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Closure bridge, bridge, we've been talking about it for seven, six, seven months. First time I came, like, oh, there's a girl. Hey, hey, you want to do Closure Bridge? I'm like, uh, I don't know Closure yet, so maybe. Um, Norman, this is probably the second first thing. Your second th thing you said, told me was, Hey, let's do closure bridge. I'm like, uh, maybe. So uh, I uh, talked with Bridget, and she's actually going to apply here for it. Wow. Um, what is the closure bridge? All right. Closure oh, bridge. Good question. <laughs> right, next slide. Uh, so it's a workshop to encourage women and underrepresented groups. She started in the Rose community in 2009 with Sarah May and Sarah Allen. They call them the Sarahs. Have the same name. Um, they uh, noticed that the uh, San Francisco Ruby Group was 3% women, but we need to change this, so they made some workshops for women. They're generally free. Friday night is a setup, and Saturday is a workshop. And after uh, a while, they counted these percentages, and it was up to 18%. So we got it set for March 14 to 15. Uh, that's a test during South by one weekend of South by, but we're gonna be up north, so I think we'll be okay. We're gonna be in rack space. Um, they've already donated their space. So on Friday we have an install fest where we will be installing closure and light table light table on people with uh, Windows, Macs, and Linux. We're limiting team this first group to be programmers, so hopefully they all have developer ready hardware and will be, you know, like, Windows, you, you suck, you can't get something working, but I think it should be okay. So the schedule on Saturday is sort of like this. We'll have sign-in, a coffee, presentation, two sessions that Bridget will probably do. And also another lady, uh, Catherine, Catherine Fellows. Fellows might be in town, so we might have two experts Closure, closure bridge ladies here. We'll have lunch, two more sessions, and then wrap up, and then we might have, we might go out afterwards and uh, and chill out. So what we need help with is volunteers. You may not be primarily responsible, but you'd be responsible for making the person that does it, you know, there. Um, so you need someone to. We're going to be ordering food for Friday night dinner, Saturday breakfast, Saturday lunch, coffee snacks. I might need someone to go pick up coffee from Starbucks. No, the to go box, to go boxes. Um, we I want to try and do one of the meals Mediterranean. That appeals to vegetarian meat eaters. This is pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty easy going for like, all types of food groups. And then have one meal be. Tacos, maybe 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 torchies, um, buffet, so that appeals to you don't want to eat cheese, you don't have to put cheese on your taco and whatnot. So I think that'd be good. And so we'll need someone for space, I guess is is locked up. We need someone at the door to let people in. So we'll need someone just to stand and open the door. And um, make sure we can access the bathrooms, so that make sure they're not they're not locked or anything like that and we'll need people to help out 
on you know Friday and Saturday when people were coming in to let them in. That's 13th, 14th, and 15th. No, 13, 13 and 14th. So, yeah. 14 and 15. Yeah. 13, 13, Friday the 13th, that night's the install fest. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Nothing could go wrong. <laughs> All right. So for the hack fest on Saturday, this coming up Saturday, we're going to meet and uh, the closure bridge has a bunch of to do's that they need help with. And even if you aren't really good at closure, there's things you can do. Um, so number one is we I made a cheat sheet of the syntax and things we went been over with in the material, just have a cheat sheet, sheet, and I just made it as a markdown file. We can make that into like a nice Google Doc with a table and like you know formatting and stuff. That would be really helpful. And we have a uh, make a troubleshooting section. Uh, like what happens if your Java error is there, so this or that. And just tell you more information about all those on the wiki or the the task. The white table instructions we have are a little bit out of date. We need to update those. And then there's this capstone app, which I guess is Quill. I don't I have not used Quill. I'm gonna be pestering Sam about that later. Yeah. And we can also make more Quill sketches. Um, create a teacher's guide if you're going through the material making more notes. Um, the curriculum has changed because I changed some of the the method, some of the pages to kind of group symbols with maps instead of them being all by themselves. Uh, I changed with us, we need to update the curriculum. Now we can always add more exercises. So some may go fast, really fast through the material, but I want to just have more things to try. So that would be great to add, and wouldn't it be too terribly hard if you're like a new closure program, you could like add some little examples. So the issues are all up there on on closure bridge slash curriculum and the GitHub issues. And I'm trying to get some of closure closure bridge founders, other people who work on it, to be on IRC during on Saturday. If you want to ask questions, or say, hey. Look at this. Is this good? You know, should this too much detail or or whatever? And so that will be <clears throat> on Saturday. So we have uh, January, February. We probably have two months to work on it to finish these things up or make things what have you want to present for March. And that's it. Any questions? So this Saturday. This Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any expectations for how many people will be there? What are you aiming for? I, 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 I'm half hoping for our usual four or five. Are <laughs> you mean at the class? Uh, no, no, at the closure bridge. The, the, the closure class. bridge. Oh, okay, so that was that'll be on the weekend. Uh, this weekend, probably we'll probably limit it to twenty students because the space, our uh, space, maybe isn't. Well, that would be a good space to spread out and have have groups. Uh, they, they typically will break the students into groups of done closure, have been closure, and kind of group it together so they can kind of work together some of the exercises. So we're going to probably limit it at, at, at 20. And if it goes well, and, the, and we'll have a wait list, if there's a lot of white people who want to do it again, we could um, do another workshop maybe in three, four months, five months. Depends how carried out we are. <laughs> Any other questions? Is there like a sign up sheet or just you? Uh, just tell me for now. Okay. But we can work out um, some more details at the thing on Saturday. I'm going to find out from Gregspace if they want to be assigned who people to be their you know, door people or instructions so they can just work with them and not. I don't want everyone to become bothering you as I'm trying to do multiple things just have this is the door guy you would need questions about the door you, you can if you need, if you need to get in you can't get in here's the door guy's phone number we can call you and uh so there's other things to do if you don't want to do like do the closure part or think you're you know that good at closure and like 
publicizing it? Or are we going to post it on Twitter and some other yeah, places? Yeah, um, we'll, we'll post it to the Closure Bridge workshop once they get the, the announcement set. Mm -hmm. And then we'll put it, put it on Twitter, and Closure Bridge, Bridge will tweet it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bridget will tweet it. We'll yeah, we can get probably Capital Factory or yeah, they can tweet send it. it out too. Um, the lady pro ladies program groups will probably tweet it out too. Cool. So we're targeting ladies who have done some programming, like PHP, Perl, Ruby, or any anything. I think that would be a lot easier, lot easier for us to teach, at least for our first class, than people who are like brand new to programming of any kind. Right. Maybe we would do one of those later. Maybe we would get some people kind of used, used to doing this format and teaching other people. I mean, maybe we can do a workshop for you know brand new beginners. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, we're gonna let Andrew do. Okay. If he runs out of time, now uh, I'll show mine. That's incredibly impossible. Is it? Okay, then I'll show mine. <laughs> no, I can do mine quickly. Well, what you've seen me talk, right? <laughs> you will have a conversation that lasts three hours. <clears throat> That's true. Okay, so um, who of you has looked at Cursif yet? Just as a raise of hands, kind of square page that idea. Just the web page, okay. Um, so let me uh, share my screen. Uh, what are these rooms, Norman? What were they? Uh, classroom. Classroom. Okay. Oh, cool. Oh, not cool. Is this the community edition? Yes. Okay. <coughs> okay, awesome. So I did resize. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, so this is cursive with actual code up of mine that I'm working on a project for, so you saw nothing. Because <laughs> I was going to change it out. After Andrew. <laughs> oh, this project. <laughs> I can take the talk. <laughs> no worries. Um, so um, one thing. Um, yeah, I'll go up here and you guys can see this. Um, right here. Um, I had to revert to closure 0.1.42. What? Whoa. Whoa. Can you revert it again? Alan who's, who's taking over the movies here? <laughs> Not me. Who is Josh? I have no I'm clue. Certainly Bear. Josh Bear. Josh, you're killing me, man. He's himself logged into the app. So, so I found a bug when I bumped up to the newest uh, Cursive plugin, which came out like the seventh or something. Anyway, there's a regression where in one four three the debugger doesn't kick correctly, right? And so I got that reply back from him. Um, anyway, it's it's hurting him too. So if anybody actually wants to use this after I give my quick demo, I do have the plugin for 142 that works properly with IntelliJ 14 Community Edition. So just let me know and I'll, I'll ship it to you. It's not very big. But I, I thought it was cool because I was using it and like 20 minutes after I popped the bug to the guy, he was like, yeah, that's that's the regression. <laughs> I'm like, yes. <laughs> it's not. Maybe a QA uh, career is in hand. <laughs> seem to find more bugs in my own code and other people's code than I write. Because so I try and optimize. So, um, so Cursive, I actually have uh, IntelliJ. Everybody can see over there, too. I should move to the side. Um, so Cursive is basically IntelliJ and 14, basically. It's a full-blown IntelliJ environment for Java. Um, loaded it with a Cursive plugin, which supports Linogen straight out of the box for doing closure projects. So any Linogen project that you've created, it'll load up in here just fine. You still need to create your project on the command line because he hasn't fully integrated the project creation step in here. But after you do it, it loads up fine. Um, all your standard kinds of things are over here. Syntax highlighting's here. 
multiple tabs, and then you've got a REPL, right? And the REPL is full blown. Um, right here, you can do your standard stuff, right? Plus four and five, do that kind of crud, right? And as you can see, I was playing around with sorted set because I can't remember how. It yeah, so it like works. you make change your code. And yeah, I'll show you that in a second. As as uh, as you work on stuff. Anyway, there is a couple of bugs, and again, this is one guy working on this project, so there's still quirks. But there's some places where you, it tells you there's syntax issues when there's not actually. It doesn't have its. Um, Syntax highlighter perfectly. In this case, it's because it's an anonymous function, so it's not working perfectly. But uh, the reason I'm here tonight is not to show you the basics of cursive necessarily. It's to show you that there's a nice debugger in cursive. Um, so just like any normal kind of list system, you can set debug points, right? What you can't do is really single step, and that's a problem we've had with closure on the JVM in general, right? But you can still stop and see all your variables. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the, the execution of the debugger that I had right here um, and show you how, how to start it up from scratch. Um, so I've got two breakpoints here, and I've got a hellaciously big uh, let statement that Norman told me I could thread. but. I haven't gone back to do that yet because I'm working on other bugs. A whole bunch of setters, and then I I pass them all to this nice render for our HTML page that's kind of got a crap load of data on it. So when you want to debug in uh, cursive, you can set up multiple edit configs, very similar to if you see CCW and Eclipse, and you can create run profiles for each of them. Um, the best ones to use are closure REPL. There is another bug that I found and reported um, that if you try and use closure application, it doesn't do the right thing currently, right? Um, so avoid that one and just do closure REPL. And I also am using a mutant for some of this stuff, so I set up an a mutant one. It auto deploys to a mutant and runs it, and does all the right stuff. That's a mutant one. Using a mutant two. It's not integrated with that yet. So use a mutant one because mutant two is still beta. So um, from a debug point of view, now that I have my REPL set up for my project, I just click the debug macro um, button and it's going to start running Leningen, start up with a little REPL and start the debugger down at the bottom. Right? So it's kind of cool. The REPL started, right? And now, I'm going to go over here. There's a little helper class I have that let me start the server and stuff. And I can go up to Tools, REPL, load the file in. It's going to load it in, evaluate all the code. As soon as it's done, it'll tell me with a little nil. And this one takes a second because it loads some other crap. All right? I have a one time exception. Percent one in this context. So yeah, I have, a, I have a bug, I can't believe it. Who would have known? Uh, this is what happens when you make changes at the last second. Every single time, that is correct. So let me. There we go, I'll go back to where it was and fix it. So I'll help you know you can actually do real code. So I'll save it, kill this again. Go down and kill this. He didn't start up successfully, right? And now I click to start him again. Now he's loading in, right? That time the server worked okay. Now we'll go here again to the repo guy. Up in your tools here, you have your normal kinds of stuff. Sync your files. That makes sure your project and your uh, source on your disk is the same. You can run from before the cursor, all that kind of stuff. Print your last exception, run your tests. 
I'm just going to load the file, see if it works this time. Cross fingers, hopefully. Oh, again? Body blow. I don't know, I hate this one. Bad demo. <laughs> that stinks. Sorry if I caused that. No, nah, you're good. I'll just undo even more. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Is that I could just replay my uh do it one more time. Kill him one more time. That's what I get for editing for get that just for an editing period. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Safety first. So again, I'm going to switch over to the REPL view, load him in because that's what I want. Hopefully, when you load him in, he's evaluating them all, right? Hopefully this time it'll work. Please work this time. If not, I'm going to create a new project. I'll show you that. Still again. Okay. Forget that. Can't believe it. I think you just need to move the percent line inside of the contains. Here? Yeah. Uh, the sorted set should have been gone. It, like... Yeah, let's try that now. This is supposed to make a set, and then that's in the contains. So we'll try it one more time. These guys are all passing their parameters correctly. A different one. That's still good. That's better. Okay. Compiler exception. Okay. So, regardless, I'm going to do this. No, not. That's not found. That's not good. Okay. Let me do this. And I quit it because I've obviously dorked it up. Um, and then if, the, if it doesn't work this time, I'll show you after downstairs. But it, it actually does work most of the time. It is still a work in progress, <coughs> right? But um, overall, it lets you see all your variables when you run. And if it doesn't work this time on now, and I'll create a little simple project, it'll take like one minute. So, so the closure is cursive for IntelliJ or Eclipse or both? IntelliJ only. Okay. If you want to use Eclipse, you got to use CCW. And I showed that one at a different meetup. Um, when it tells you to update, don't, don't listen to it. <laughs> Let's try one more time. Does CCW have the same problem? You can't use that the debugger? CCW doesn't do debugger, yeah. Oh. Cursive is the only one. There's, I don't know of any closure debuggers that let you do step. You can do trace. There's a trace. 
uh, package that's in part of standard closure. And uh, you can do that, but I don't know of any of them that let you uh, do stuff. As a matter of fact, the only build this if I know that lets you do stuff or scheme and common list. Say again? It's 43 this bad? Oh, yes. So that was what it was. It dorked itself when I messed up the other guys. Okay, so I loaded this REPL, the, the REPL handlers in, right? Now, like normal closure, I gotta tell it I wanna use Notice it pops up all my namespaces for me. That's really nice for code editing and stuff. And this REPL file isn't loaded by default by my project. It's just an extra one to help you start a server, right? A Jetty server. So I load it in by hand by using the tools. And then I say I want to use the REPL. It loads all the namespaces in when I hit command return. And now I can say start server, right? And it'll start up the Jetty server, which you'll see. It'll switch me over to my project. And let me, uh, here's all my beautiful tabs, right? And so, I'll log in. This is like a project, right? So this is a little web app working on. And, um, so I started up in debug mode, right? So now I'm gonna hit view on here, and boom, I stopped in debug mode, right? I stopped at where the blue line is, and if I bring the debug view up, I can see my entire stack chain, and I can also see all the variables I have in context, right? So if I wanna see what work order types is, I can go down here and see work order types, and I can expand it there and scroll, or I can choose inspect on here, and it'll bring up a nice little inspector window, and I can see my values and look at them. And I reported another bug on a couple of these things too, but for the most part, they're pretty usable now. And you can see the value, it's three character array, it's hash, and it's hash 32 value. And it, the reason the hash 32 may matter to you is because how closure data structures are 32 hash trees. So seeing that helps you sometimes understand the structure of the data, right? And then, so. Can you go into call stack? Say again? Can you go up the call stack? Yeah, I can go, I can go here. And I can see my calls, my call chain. And, and I lied to kind of a little bit about, you can't single step. When I'm, what I mean by single step is I can single step here, but it's not going to show me drilling down into each of the forms. That's what I meant. You can't go like, into, you mean? You can go in, right? Okay. You can go in, but what I'm used to and what I, what I was really saying is, like on, on the common list systems I use, they actually highlight the parentheses, the nested forms, as you step into them. Whereas this doesn't really do a lot of, like I'm gonna go ahead and step into order manage DDB core list work orders and you'll see it. So I'm gonna click on the step into and boom, I stepped in, right? So it jumps me into the function, right? So now I can, I can step in to flatten if I want, but it's, it's really stepping into map. So it's kind of doing it, right, sorta but the highlighting doesn't just highlight the form, it highlights the whole line. So if you have multiple forms on the line, it kinda is tricky. If you wanna really debug, put everything on its own line, each form on its own line, and then you'll get the correct highlighting behavior. That's, that's what I meant by it doesn't step that way, right? It does single step from a Java point of view, but in terms of the highlighting the forms point of view, it doesn't do that. Like Dr. Scheme or Racket, they do the right thing, so. Um, so here, I'll step in again, and notice I'm jumping into exec raw, right? So at any one of these points, I can see the values on the stack at that point, see the arguments to the function. And I can go up here and, uh, you know, 
look at which arguments they are and try and find them down here, right? So it's kind of cool. Um, what would be really neat is if you could, you know, hover here and see what SQL is. But you can't really hover there, but you can go down here and see that it's bound. When you click on it here, the highlight's up there. And it kind of inherits that from IntelliJ. Right. But the guy working on it is, is doing a lot more. And then you can step out, right? So you step out of this call, step out of that call, and then step over this call, and then you'll see the last variable that got updated down here is in blue, right? So that's the last value that changed. And then you can inspect that, right? Um, I filed a bug on this evaluate expression. It's got a little spot in there and it implies that you can type in closure code. But if you try and type in closure code that looks at the variables that are currently on the stack, it doesn't resolve them correctly yet. So he knows about that, but it's still, it's coming. And I'm like pumped about that to be able to type some arbitrary code on the current values on the stack will be cool. But uh, any of these things, like for me, it's been really useful to look at all the params to my HTML call, all these map entries, because this is uh, composure code. And then, um, um, you know, being able to see, you can switch and see your content console output if you have any. Um, most of it goes to the REPL. And then over here, you can do some stack frame stuff. Look at the breakpoints you have set, unset them. Here you can put in a condition and you can type some closure code. I haven't tried that out yet, but supposedly you can put some closure code in there or some Java code, either one. Let you choose, right? So you can put, like, after a hundred of them, it'll print out something or whatever, right? And log messages and stuff like that. So normal kinds of loop stops and all that kind of stuff that you would have in a debugger. I, I haven't tried these, but I'm, I would guess some of them work, right? And on this, if the closure doesn't work, try and put a regular Java expression in there. It probably works, because the IntelliJ will probably work there. Um, what else was I going to show? Those are the big things. Um, source control is built in, widget and stuff, automatically built in. So that's that's really nice. Um, there's a DB navigator which I use sometimes to view stuff. But here you can see all your runs and stuff. These let you choose after you do it from the menu bar. You can do it up here. But these are all still valid while you're debugging. You can use these command keys to do this stuff. So it's a little quicker than what I do. I point and click all the time. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Check it out. So do you prefer this over light table so far? Or it's yeah, I, like I, more than one than the other? Or do you I've had a, check it out? Yeah, I've had a on and off relationship with light table. There were several times where I downloaded an update and it would never run correctly. So I was like, you know, one of those. This works and it's good. Before this, I used CCW for the most part is what I used. Um, and I like CCW, but this is just so much nicer. And it has debugging. And it, for you guys, depending on your style of development, but I tend to make a change, run it, and look at the values. Fix it, make a change, run, and look at the values. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people write code, a whole bunch of code, run it. But I don't do that. I, I still write code like I was in a small talk system where I can inspect the objects and change the code on the fly for whatever reasons I still go with that. So it's, I'm not the most efficient coder. And it's um, the only line line breakpoints. So if you want like an inner form or something, you have to like put it on different lines. Yeah. Before yeah, and, and even then it's not 100%, right? It doesn't get it perfect. But if you put the forms on different lines, you can you can break there pretty reliably. Um, those are the big things. Like I said, he's still working on it a lot. It's basically one guy. And um, if you do start using it, he is going to start selling it when he gets it finished. That's his intent. Um, and 
the way I see it is this is like the most advanced one out there for closure. So, yeah. Can you, uh, when you're in the REPL, can you look at doc, some function name? Does that, does that work in, in the REPL there? Let me see. Did we lost your screen. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta log back in anyway. <laughs> Safety first. <laughs> so here in the in the repo, yeah. you're wondering if I type something like like doc or source. I type doc and what car or first? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Old habits die hard. So I'm still in the middle of a debug, so it's not showing me anything. But that being said, you can go up here and um, in here, you can actually run another REPL and do it in that REPL. If I, if I go ahead and finish like letting this execute, then you can see that it was suspended in this REPL. But you can actually have multiple REPLs open at once. This one was just stopped in the bar, but it shows you the doc. But you can do something like this uh, first, right? And then um, A, B, C. Here, if you, if you type that, it does your kind of apropos matching on some of this stuff. Right, so it's it's not perfect there, but if you do your namespaces too, like uh, like I did that, order management, debug core, and then you can do slash, and let's do f, no f, uh, actually there was an f that was still query. There you go. Oh. Um, let's do L. That should find a bunch. L. Oh. Oh, I know why. Because I didn't. I didn't use those in the REPL. If you want to see those, you have to use them. In here or load them at the very least, right? If I want to see this guy, I have to load him into the REPL, and then it'll then it'll match, right? But it it's only inside of your code. I, I guess that's a better way to to answer the question. Inside of your code in here, and you can make this bigger. Inside of your code in here, it will match, right? like on this guy, I'll copy that. When I do list, it matches. In the REPL, it doesn't do as much if you don't load it, at least. But inside your co code, where you've already done your requires and imports, it'll pop all there. In your REPL, if you use them and, and require them, then it'll do the same thing in there, right? But since I didn't use or load anything besides the, the REPL, it's not gonna match there. Like if I do this one here, the one I did, right? Those are the ones it's finding, right? But if I go back over to this REPL here and load this in again, right? Then it'll, it'll find anything that I've loaded in. Come on, Ari. Who said job is fast? Oh, no, I'm in the debugger. That's it. So, okay, here we go. There we go. So now it, it found all the symbols that match out of that file name that I used. So, there you go. I was stuck in the debugger still. All right. So if I do uh, order management, DB core, slash uh, find companies. So it, it does anybody that I've got loaded. Does that, does that match what you wanted? Yeah. Okay. 
So as long as you load them in there, you're good. Cool. Any other questions? Anybody? Now that I've taken 28 minutes from Andrew. I, you, know, you just said there's no parking validation. We're going to go till 10. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No questions? Does anybody actually want to use it now that you've seen me crash it? Oh, I forgot to tell you one other thing. Sorry. Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> um, it does have structural movement. So it supports um, full um, S expression walking, right? I don't have the key bindings set up, but you can create your own key bindings or make them mat match the Emacs stuff. So you can move around with forms and select forms from the inside out, move them, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it works pretty good. Um, there's a like top to bottom normal kinds of stuff, right? So you can you can do I don't have the bindings, but when you turn those bindings on and you have on the smart guys it'll automatically select this whole form from here to here automatically with the key combos, right? So when whatever you used to on your Emacs closure mode, you can basically do the same things there. And that works. I played with the other day, but I turned off the, the bindings I had because there are a couple of conflicts with uh, some of the mat key bindings and I didn't have time to figure out what they were. So, but it works pretty good. Um, I find it easier to use than CCW and certainly easier to use than VI or some of those. And the debugger takes, saves me tons of time. So, cool. Thank you. I love the selection on this. This is awesome. All right. Now we're going to watch Dora, right? Dora the Explorer, yeah, since we're dealing with toy machines. Okay. Toy machines, right? Hi there. Um, I'm Andrew Donahoe. You guys seem to uh, invite me every spring to come talk about something that's not closure. Okay. And so uh, I'm back. And I'm very happy to be here. And I'm so glad you, uh, you chose to have me. Okay. We should make me. That looks really small. It looks like it's going to be really hard to read. So I'm going to let's go look at the screen. Let's see if we can change that. Let's see what the best of the classroom looks like. Mirroring. It's not doing anything, is it? So it thinks that's best for classroom. Okay, we'll go with it. All right. Okay, so um, this is a talk, or Apple's new language, Swift, looks a lot like Python. And so I'm involved with the Python community, and they know I'm sort of like the only Mac guy, that, an iOS guy that hangs out with the Python community. And so when Swift was announced in June, some people asked, uh, asked if I would give a talk to them. So this actually, this talk I'm going to give you actually ended up at the Pi Texas conference. Um, in other words, all the folks in Texas, I had a full room about three, twice the size of this of people uh, wanting to see this, lang uh, see this language. So I'm very, very glad and pleased that you guys uh, honored me with your presence uh, to see, see this also. Um, so what are we going to talk about? A little bit about me, then we're going to look in the Swift playground which is basically their uh, equivalent of the IPython notebook, which is basically an interactive Python with, uh, with text. And then we're going to look at uh, an app. Um, I'm going to use a different app than the one I used in the PyTexas conference. I'm going to use a, a, a project I call Boone, named after Daniel Boone, a tracker, because it tracks you. Um, you always take an app that you know, or you know all the technologies in to use a new language. And so um, two years ago, I did the Capital Factory startup crawl app for, I did it three times and it had a map and stuff like that. So I had a bunch of Objective-C code and I could play, uh, do things. 
Then we'll, uh, during this part, like you're going to learn a bit about iOS app architecture and iOS MVC, which is a lot different. So about me, okay, um, five plus year iOS developer, 30 plus year Mac developer. I do stuff in Python, big data. I teach at Boston Community College of Python Programming. Um, if you want to blame me for things, um, you can blame me for SVG v1, not, but not the path syntax, not my fault. Okay. Um, you can blame me for XHTML v1 and v1.1. I was involved in both of those. Universal plug and play, it's not my fault, it doesn't work. Um, but you can blame me anyway. Um, I was uh, one of the people involved with Mac clones. I've written, built uh, parallel computers and, and uh, accelerators in the Mac, and I did one of the earliest scientific visualization apps available to the planet called Mac Spin. <clears throat> so let's get right to it. Um, if you just Google Swift programming language, one of the top things that pops up is this link, okay? And this link takes you to, takes you to here. All right. <coughs> what we have here is a complete notebook of apples in this Swift tour. And so, this is canned on their website, but if you download the playground, you have all of the text and code directly manipulable. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the playground, which I've already downloaded, and we'll take a look at that. But you can get it here, you know, log in with your Mac, and or just as I said, Google with it. Okay, so let's come over here. Very big, is it? Okay, so it's uh, so we're going to zoom in at multiple places, right? But let's talk a bit about the language. Okay. So you guys program a language, Clojure, that tries to. Um, like uh, like uh, Python and I believe Ruby, it is strongly typed. The objects have strong type. The slots that you store them in are not strongly typed. They could be anything you want. Okay. And this is one of the key characteristics uh, is claimed of a dynamic language. Swift is a strongly typed language. And the slots end up having strong types. But type information is something, because it exploits auto-inferencing, is largely hidden. In, in fact, what you will find is you mostly do, you'll be putting types in function declarations. And that's pretty much the only place that you'll be putting types. So simple values, simple code is simple. Okay, so we see the variable here. It's zooming on my screen, but not on yours. Okay, sorry. Um, can you all read that, or should I go to the plugin and do the hardware thing? It's, it, I because I mean, I, I'm kind of in the front, though. <laughs> I, I could use it a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, can you do your display that. thing, Andrew? If you do your displays. And change your res, it'll zoom in on the screen. Yeah. Let's do that. I thought I had done that, but great. Okay. Put it there. Okay. So now we're doing 720p. Is everything bigger now? Looks yeah, bigger to me. Much nicer. Okay. Um, so this is this is live code. 
Hello, closurians. Okay. And you can see over here, it's changed. It was executing. Now this whole page is compiled each time you hit return. Okay, so there's a complete compiler pass that goes on. So when I change this to um, um, okay, you see it goes gray and then it goes black. Well, it's going through the whole the whole the whole page and compiling everything. Okay, um, so it's not as interactive as some of you would like. Almost certainly Sam doesn't like it. Okay. Um, so it does things as you would expect. Um, it implicitly understands that 42 here is an integer. So that's declared as a variable integer. And you can change it. It also has immutable values. So we can't change constant. Can't change my constant. So let's do all right, try to do that, and it doesn't change. We get an error. <coughs> the error. But you're in Xcode here, so you're in you're in the complete full-fledged language environment. So it's brought up the brought up the error. We cannot assign to let value my constant. <coughs> so you guys are in closure. You understand immutability. <coughs> immutability is a, is a key part of your language choice. Right? Because iOS and OS 10 are so heavily multi-queued um, and multi-processor, they have multi-processor affinities, they have, this platform has a very strong embrace of immutable nature too. And so, for example, you almost will never declare things there. You know, almost always will declare them as constants or lets. Um, it doesn't mean you can't change the object, you just can't change the top level piece of the object. You may have a mutable object in it. Um, the virtue of this is when you start throwing things into blocks, you can then start having them running on background threads very easily. One of the problems that languages like Python have, even if they solved their global interpreter lock problem, the culture of the language is such that everything is mutable. And so it doesn't go into multi-threaded environments at all, though. And in fact, all the people who have tried to run Python in, uh, on the uh, JPythons or Jython, I guess is what it's called, um, find that their code runs fine, library code doesn't. And that's because the culture of Python is a um, mutable culture. Okay, you guys come from an immutable space, so you'll you'll feel comfortable about this. Okay. Um, type is type is inferred. Okay. Um, things you'd expect. You basically have um, addition is concatenation. Strings have this feature called interpolation. So basically, you can put almost any expression you want in here, and it will calculate it and, and put it out. Now, most uh, commercial iOS and OS 10 applications won't use this very much because they have localization issues they have to deal with. And so Apple has a complete library for managing your strings and pulling them in and doing all this stuff. So you will almost never do this kind of substitution in your commercial code. But that doesn't mean your log statements can't have this stuff in it. Your log statements definitely can have this stuff in it. Um, okay, so we have, as you would expect, for containers. Um, so here we have a bunch of strings, okay? And you basically, you know, square bracket, and then it infers that this is a uh, an array. Well, um, what is the type of the array? Um, it basically is a type. Okay. And basically, this is shorthand for OK. 
Okay, so basically, as you would see now, we're starting to see them C++ roots. Okay, so we're starting to see template substitutions, template syntax, so we're seeing things that are sort of C-derived syntax items are starting to pop up. Um, but the various types have these shorthands that should make you all feel warm and comfortable. Come on. Um, uh, dictionaries are straightforward. You could have any object as an index into a dictionary. So here we have occupations, Malcolm, Kaylee, public relations, Jane. Jane is not good at public relations, as you might gather. Okay. Um, control flow is the kind of stuff you'd expect uh, in an imperative language for in, all that sort of stuff. Um, optional. So now here is the key feature that totally weirds out most of the imperative language people. Objective-C has a characteristic in its object model, is that you can always send a message for any object to nil and will not crash. And this is a good feature, particularly when you're dealing with a language that has very primitive um, exception handling like C has. All right. So this nil execution feature is really quite nice. It's a very useful feature. Um, but it also is the source of some extremely subtle bugs. Because your code looks like it's executing until it isn't. And of course, in multi-threaded environments, lots of weird stuff happens. And so now we have this question mark here. This is not a predicate. This is not trying to say, let's do some testing and, and do a Boolean evaluation or anything like that. What this is, the question mark is, is more akin to the English of, is this really a string? Is it really here? So when you have your type followed by a question mark in Swift, it is boxed. You can't just access it. You have to unbox it. And so how do you unbox it? Um, you unbox it with this statement here. You basically create an unboxed version of this by the assignment in the if, so that the name unboxed is available in this scope. As soon as you leave this scope, optional name is still boxed. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, fall down to the rest of the uh, rest of the function. It only is unboxed in that scope. Now this is kind of painful when you see it in these kinds of simple examples. And in fact, it is one of the most um, controversial features of Swift that it has this optional support. The virtue is it helps make your code type safe, particularly when you're bringing code in or you're interfacing with Apple's Cocoa Toolkit. Apple's Cocoa Toolkit is based upon these fundamental assumptions like sending messages to nil. So it sends back things that are nil all the time. And they're used as semaphores, they're used as, as Boolean tests, they depend upon the falsiness rules of C, which is basically everything is true except zero, which is false. Um, that is not the case in, in Swift. And so the optionals are the things that are the thing that have the most syntactic noise. Noise is the is the term I would use for that. Because they force you to make if you had to unbox several things, what you end up with is a pyramid of, of if lets. Okay, and it can get quite ugly. Now they have some compact forms that if you're going down a common data structure where you just put the question mark in as you do the chaining, all right, and then things get nice, okay? But um, you'll find that many people complain about the optional syntax. Um, 
I myself have been designing the, some of the classes you'll see and some of the ways I use some of the methods in the class. You'll see me using this as uh, using the optional nature to guarantee that certain cryptographic operations completed properly. So in other words, I use it as a key part of the guarantee process of when I'm encrypting and decrypting things. All right, so it's, I find it to be quite useful, but it takes time. Um, unlike C and uh, uh, C++, we have a very general purpose switch statement. You can basically put almost any object in here. It doesn't have to be a constant. Okay, just has to have well-defined values and a default. Okay, so celery, cucumber, um, you can go look into it and see if it has the word pepper. So basically these, these case statements can become extremely flexible. Whereas the, so the, the switch case statement, which is uh, frequently just a, um, is frequently used as a holdover from uh, procedural languages rather than having using objects for dispatch on object type. Um, you'll find that there's going to be a lot more interesting uses, I believe, in Swift because of the dynamic nature of each of the cases. Okay. All right. So, um, like Python, it has tuple expansion. So you can assign, look, go through this. Um, interesting numbers and uh, go through the through the array and it pulls out the two at a time and then there's a culture of the underbar which is ignore this thing ignore this thing we just created um, and so that has some virtues in that you're taking symbol noise out of your loops okay um, and so you will see this underbar show up in a lot of aspects of, of the way Apple works, um, Apple's frameworks work. So um, they have while loops, do while loops, good old fashioned uh, for loops. So now this is a range syntax. This range syntax is zero dot dot less than four. So that's zero to three. Those are the three values that come out. If you wanted to go um, all the way and include four, you put a third dot. Okay. So um, they also have good old fashioned um, numeric loops for C people. So we're at a closure meeting. What makes Swift, one of the things that makes Swift interesting from an imperative language perspective is that closures are the fundamental item for packaging up function, packaging up behavior in Swift. Function is just a named closure, not the other way around. The closure isn't some specialized thing added late in the language. It's actually the first class item, and putting a name on a closure is what makes it a function. iOS OS 10 framework, parallel computing framework, is called Grand Central Dispatch. Grand Central Dispatch does all of its multiprocessing in a queued model operating on Objective C blocks or C blocks. These closures are the same as C blocks. They wrap over. Um, wrap over code and can be pushed into the OS. So these closures work very closely with the operating system based queuing system. And so the kind of world that you guys are used to trivially makes maps into the parallel computing world. It happens just almost for free. It's and in fact, it is designed to be almost for free. Um, in the iOS world, they very much want to encourage you to get your code off of the main thread. The main thread is where the UI is. The main thread is where the graphics system interacts. And so if you want butter smooth animation, 
you better not be doing any computing on that thread. And so with the deep embrace of, of blocks and closures, they made it easier for developers to push things off of the main thread. And we'll show you, I'll show you how that works in, uh, in the sample code. Do they have like a promise, some sort of promise or feature framework for figuring out when things are done? No, what you end up doing is the um, embedded, embedded block pattern. So like a continuation with a, with a callback? Well, I, I wouldn't call it a callback. It's, a, it's an embedded closure inside. So basically you'll go through and then you'll call on, you'll do a thread jump back to the main thread, passing a block to the main thread, which then executes and communicates typically to the rest of the program. Did I, okay, it sounds like I got that right. Um, well, here we got a pen. I mean, this is a very common pattern in iOS and OS 10 programming, independent of Swift. And since we're gonna talk about app architecture, in, in a bit, we may as well use this now, okay. Um, all right, start of app life, end of app life, the infinite loop, all right, this is where it stays, this is the run loop, okay. Um, but you can have other threads, all right. Um, and what you will see happening is, if you wanna jump off thre the thread into the queue, GCD will put you down here, or actually, what they say, put you down here, you start to execute, and then you'll have an embedded uh, closure. So basically just think of it, stuff, stuff, stuff. You'll have another block, and then this stuff. These the two closures. So this is the code that gets thrown onto the main thread. This is the code that's on the, on the background thread. But it's some sort of queue, event queue on the main thread that picks it up at some point in the future. Right, at some point. Execute your block. Right, and you know that it will be serialized with respect to all other events. Yeah. Okay, so there, there are some guarantees that happen from here. Where, so what you'll tend to see happening in lots of OS 10 iOS code is that the run loop, in, in the more sophisticated the application, the less work is done on the run loop. It becomes, basically a fancy synchronization center for it, right? But it's using uh, you know, good old fashioned communicating sequential processes semantics, right? We know it's gonna happen in order. We, we can say certain things, like we know that this block, since blocks can't be stopped, we know that this block will only start when this one basically says so. And so you can basically enforce order of operation in a totally asynchronous fashion with this embedded pattern. Is there something similar to this in Clojure? I'm sure you guys are jumping queues all the time, right? It'd be the async queues. Or async. Yeah. Yeah, core async would be the process. I'm not familiar with any of the uh, like GUI type stuff, though. I don't know what you well, this do. isn't even GUI stuff. This is just scheduling. This is just scheduling and queuing that's built into the. Into yeah, the I mean, we have promises and stuff like that. Right. I suspect we are going to see because of the generic type nature of Swift, we're gonna see people developing promise um, classes that are all about rendezvousing through uh, customized queues. And the promises probably won't even rendezvous through, here, rendezvous through here. They'll probably have their own private queues that are used for rendezvousing. So that they don't even have to have any overhead up here. So, you know, in iOS, it's, it literally is a one-liner to create your own queue, you right? You have no mutexes, you have nothing. That you, so all of the difficulty of multi-threaded programming is dramatically reduced because you're using CSP semantics. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we'll come back to this, but this block pattern is, of course, very well uh, supported within Swift because closures are first class items. You know, and their primary functions are just named closures. Methods are named closures that have access to state. Okay. Um, so uh, basically you know, standard sort of function stuff. All right. So. This is new for C-based language. All of you dynamic language people know about returning tuples. Okay. Well, we can now return tuples with the interior types uh, defined. Um, 
Um, all right, so here's the return statement. So a little bit more syntactic noise than what it would be in Python, uh, which wouldn't have the parens. Okay, and I don't know what it would be, closure. Um, <clears throat> the important thing, and you'll see this in the code I'll show you later, is that each of these individual items could be optional, or there's a different variant with a bang on it, and the bang means it's a dangerous thing. Bang is an exclamation point. Okay. Um, you could also make the whole return value optional. And that becomes quite useful. And you'll show, I'll show you, you me using that characteristic later. Okay. Um, good old fashioned variadic arguments. So you can add the arbitrary number of arguments. Um, functions, first class types. Okay, so here basically here you have embedded functions. Okay, which you would expect since they're closures. Okay, they just happen to be named. Um, you have functional programming mechanisms because closures are such a key part of the language. You know, all, all the collection classes have these basic maps and reduces and that sort of stuff is built into the language. Or built into the collection classes, per se. Um, objects are, you know, the only difference is it has a, a, a class and it has, you know, names of variables and functions. Um, Classes have to have initializers, you know, the kind of, you know, you all know about this kind of stuff. I mean, these are, these are straightforward syntactic things. You all know they have to have initializers. There's some, um, there are some deinitializers. Um, let's see. Look at this one in particular. So this is one of the, this is a designated initializer. And that's a term, it's a holdover term from Objective C. You could have many different kinds of initializers. But the designated ones are the ones that actually would go up the tree. The convenience initializers went to the side. Typically, it was like a partial function. It didn't have things and default values would be mailed in as it went across the tree to get to the designated one to go up. Okay. Um, but here we're starting to see some of the holdover, uh, good holdover from the small talk roots that, are, that, is, uh, that Objective C is based on. I mean, you know, the reason Objective C uses square brackets and you have this gang sign, right, you know, is because we're all small talk one users, right? Mm -hmm. We don't do that anymore. Now we're just like, you know, now parents dumb. Okay, we're with you guys now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what you're seeing here is named parameters. Okay, and so in the initializer is a special case where you typically will end up naming every parameter as a specialization so you can have multiple designated uh, initializers. Um, but this is a characteristic because in Objective-C and Smalltalk before it, message dispatch was seen as a sentence. You had a subject that you send the verb message to. And so almost all of the methods you will see in Objective-C try to read like sentences. So you'll see, um, this isn't a good example. We'll show you some later. Um, Does it let you, I saw the, the basically the field is like a, a bar there. Can you do like a let to make an immutable field or? Yes, you can. Yeah, so there are signs once, but it, there's some very careful things you have to do in order of, of assignment. How you assign it, yeah. Right, and um, there's also the concept of memoization, or what they call lazy loading. So basically you can declare something, say lazy var, and then assign a function to it. That function is only called the very first time it's executed, the first time it's the, met, the property is called. And then it's not called again. Mm -hmm. and that, that The result of that is cache. Sure. All right. Um, so the kinds of things that um, that are expensive, you ignore, right? You ignore until you actually need them. Right. Um, so going on further down, um, classic, you know, examples of, of uh, object-oriented stuff. Let's get down a little further. Enumerations. All right. So enumerations are much more complex. Um, and what we're starting to also see here is that we have structures with behavior. So classes can be inherited from 
structures cannot be inherited from, but you can define all the behaviors you like on the, on the structure. So you can basically think of this under the covers is this is the same as a standard C-struct that has a well-defined set of functions that apply to it that are just statically compiled and there's a namespace mangling that moves them all around. Right? But the virtue of this is this structure here, this is an enum variant of the structure, is basically it is a very compact data structure. There's no V tables, there's no dispatch stuff, etc. You're boom, you're in it and you're on. So that's one of the things you'll start to see with Swift is Swift really is named Swift for a reason. Not just that they found trademarks that they could go crush on some, you know, Java framework. I think there's something called Swift that got crushed by, by Apple. Um, but their focus is because they have type, their compiler can actually start snapping things together so that they go fast. And so you'll see these data structures show up that allow their collections to run faster. So, um, for example, uh, uh, what's called an NS array, which stands for next step array, is the standard dynamic array in iOS and OS X. And a Swift array is close to an order of magnitude faster because there's no dynamic dispatch. It's basically, it knows the structures, the compiler knows them, the programmer doesn't, and it goes through and does it. Uh, it goes through and executes on it. So, one, one question occurs to me is, um, is Swift garbage collected? It's precisely read. We'll go into the memory model. It's just a, but that, that's very. So it's like C++ where it's uh, itself um, reference counted. Reference counted. It is a reference counted environment, and there's a very special way that it's used that interacts with that run. Okay. And there's a thing called an auto release pool that lets you precisely know when things are read. So are cycles an issue then? Cycles are an issue, and there is in fact a declaration. You can make things instead of not just var, you can add qualifiers on like weak. Okay. Which means they aren't cycle. Um, okay. So here's an example of a struct. Okay. And um, the default initializer. Um, so one of the things that the Objective-C people are very proud of is that back in the early, uh, late, early, late 80s, early 90s, they invented this thing they called uh, the protocol. Java people called them interfaces. Um, and they, what they found is that combined with the delegation pattern gave them an incredible amount of object composition flexibility. They were starting to run into, uh, before other people, the um, drawbacks of inheritance. Inheritance makes strict, strict hierarchies. And while initially we thought, uh, back in the 80s, we thought that um, inheritance would give us better encapsulation, it turned out to be a hard hierarchy to manage. And that, that inexperienced programmers would tend to do very deep hierarchies, which ended up being an extremely um, too tightly coupled set of classes, rather than go through what, <coughs> what I believe is more orthodox these days, which is a composition model, which has, you know, a new class may have a bunch of other characteristics that you expose through interfaces that you then map onto the right objects, as the case may be. Um, so the Objective-C people are very proud of, of protocols. Extensions are equally interesting. The Objective-C dynamic runtime and Swift maps onto dynamic C, uh, Objective-C runtime as well as its own runtime that it can compile into. One of the characteristics of the Objective-C runtime is that I can take operating system data structures like that aforementioned NSRA and I can add my own methods to it, I can add my own variables to it. Now, it's because it's all done under the covers with C magic, it's an extremely cumbersome and painful process to do that. But it is a key part of the runtime that we can do these things. And so as a result, Swift also does it, 
but it turns out to be really useful to add new behavior to, to, uh, to existing classes. So one of the things you'll see later on is that um, JSON's data type in Objective C, the unparsed JSON, is not a string. The standard data type is an NS data item, which is basically an object wrapper around a malloc block. And the reason is, is that once you've converted it out, once you've parsed it, you typically are going to go send it somewhere to a file, put it in a, a web transaction, etc. And you no longer actually ever look at it as a string. You basically, you then start using it as this data item that you're throwing around. And so the NS data class was better. Well, I'll show you a class where I add the function that will open up that data item and print, print me a pretty printed JSON string. Or give me back a pretty, print, pretty printable JSON string, which is nicely formatted and all that sort of stuff. Yet, I'm adding this to NS data item, a workhorse class. So, you, so you're monkey patching slots? Basically, I'm monkey patching but adding slots. Okay. I can add eyebar slots, I can add method slots. Monkey patching is undefined behavior. You can do it, they won't guarantee that the next version of the OS will execute it. Now, by and large, it has happened. Okay. Um, So I would say it's actually more than monkey patching. I don't know the monkey patching in the traditional languages like Python that you can actually add new IVARs, et cetera, without subclassing. We're not subclassing. We're just banging the stuff on. Actually, Python, because everything's a dictionary. Yeah, you can just bang totally anything. Totally just bang, bang wherever you want. Bang anything you want anywhere. Same thing with JavaScript. OK. That always. JavaScript gives me the willies. Um, OK. Um, so let's go down a little bit. Okay, so now here's the other marquee feature of Swift. Okay, they brought generic types to this dynamic language. And the key virtue is, of course, always with generic types, is that you get performance as a result. And so, for example, <clears throat> while the aforementioned NS array is what's called toll-free bridged to the Swift array, and they're vice versa, you can pass a Swift array to, to uh, Coco, and you can take a Coco thing and pass it to Swift stuff. The Swift version of that is much, much faster. It's not box and everything, because that's the idea. It's, it's not, it's no, no dynamic dispatch, etc. The table is there so that when Coco needs to do it, it can do it, okay? Um, but that's what's called toll-free bridge. Also under the cover, toll-free bridging applies to its basic C versions of everything. So there's a C version of almost every class that Apple, that's a fundamental class in, in the Apple platform. Okay. And that's where the toll-free bridging started, but they used it in the Swift context also. Um, <coughs> so the generic types, as you can see, you can start doing things with sequence types and generator elements and you know, I myself have not gone down in, down this rabbit hole yet. Okay, and the generic type rabbit hole is a deep, impenetrable place. Um, when I first saw that they decided to use the angle bracket notation, I just sort of my ears started to in sympathy with C plus plus people. But the, it seems to be a, a less arcane syntax than what we've seen in C plus plus. In many ways, they're more civilized. Um, so this guided tour basically takes you through all of those things. I recommend you do it. Do all the do all the um, little examples, the little experiments that they call out. It's extremely easy to do. You can get a very strong, quick taste of the language, okay. and that's the whole point of that tour. Now, Apple's fully documented this language. While you no longer print these things out, I've counted the pages, the, the language reference manual is at least this thing. Okay. 
Okay, and a large part of that is how it maps into Objective C and other stuff like that. Um, one of the questions people frequently have is, uh, particularly from uh, other communities than the Apple community, is is Apple ever going to support Swift on other platforms? Well, I can't speak for Apple, but my reading of the uh, fruit company's intentions is no. They don't care. Ever support anything on other platforms? Um, iTunes is on Windows. iTunes is on Windows. That's all. They, they make some very, very strategic decisions, right? And they are, they are actually a very strong supporter of open source technologies, right? You know, anything they do in SQLite goes back. Right. Cups. Say again? Cups. Cups. Yeah. It's a printing subsystem. Printing subsystem. So there are plenty of things that they contribute to. You just, most people don't know that they contribute to them. But if they created a, a, a technology of their own, by and large, in a strategic, strategic stuff doesn't go back. They'll take stuff in and they will be good partners. But if they created it from scratch, it doesn't go out. That's just their policy. Um, having been uh, in my my uh, prior corporate gig, you know, I was a uh, technology strategist for IBM, so we understood very clearly how corporations make investments. So back in 2000, IBM made a lot of noise about putting a billion dollars into Linux. Does everyone remember that? Do you all know why we did it? Is AIX was getting a No, no, no. It had a very specific strategic goal. The specific strategic goal was to take Microsoft's competitive advantage as the vendor of the least cost commodities platform, server platform. They basically say, oh, you missed Microsoft, you get $400 or $300 for NT server. Okay, this is before XP, this is Windows 2000 server. All right, oh, if IBM can say, okay, Linux is solid, we bet our business, bet a billion dollars on it, then it became a credible thing for many IBM customers to start using. And it became a credible thing for many people who weren't IBM customers. Now, the interesting shuffle is that many people who don't understand how big companies work thought that IBM was spending a new billion dollars. They were not spending a new billion dollars. They moved some of their money around that they were going to spend anyway. They spent it differently to reach the same goals and they just totaled everything up to get to the B number, B work, okay? Um, but it was a successful play. And actually, they did put a lot of money into it. They just moved a lot of people off of AIX and basically started this long-term transition away to, to Linux-based stuff. And so the Linux Technology Center here up in, uh, up on uh, the IBM North there um, is very strong. Lots of good kernel hackers there. Okay. Um, lots of technology being developed there that are given back. Anyways, enough about my past. Sorry. Okay. Um, so let's now look at some code. Um, let's go back. Ah, good, got the right side this time. Okay, so what I what I told the folks at PyTex is I did this dragging example. Okay. Since then, I've done this my own personal example, but I wanted to leave this link in the, in the foil so if you all wanted to do it. But basically what you do is you type UI Gesture Recognizer Swift Tutorial, okay? And a Gesture Recognizer is, a, is the thing in iOS that measures taps, pinches, pivots, three finger drags, double taps, taps. So that's the fundamental data item. So if you want to drag <laughs> stuff around, like you saw when, when, uh, when you were starting, I had my little application <laughs> and I was moving images around. Those are all gesture recognizers that are getting fired. Okay, so they have a very simple example um, by, I guess, Carolyn Begbie and, and Ray Winderly. Okay, you can get it this way, but the Google, the Google URL, human URL works really well. You can Bing it if you want to, if you prefer Bing colon, okay. I bet even Yahoo code will work. Um, but we're not gonna do that, but we're now gonna 
Uh, if we have time, do we still have time? Or do you need that back, Chris? Yeah, are you, are you having gonna, slides online? Yeah, these foils, I'm making them totally okay. available. Yeah, it's, they're, they're, they're nine foils, <laughs> they're nothing deep here. And the whole point is to, I won't be making the source code to my Boom project available, but, um, I just to but these sort of things, yes. All right, so we are at uh, 8.30, got another 30 minutes. Um, so we're going to start talking about app architecture, iOS app architecture, and how that affects the, the language. And then we'll start to show a, uh, I'll start to show an app I'm building in Swift that interoperates with a bunch of my Objective C libraries. And so we'll watch the transition between languages, where I use optionals. Um, you'll get the idea. Okay. So. Um, so the app architecture, every iOS app has deterministically managed memory. You know exactly how memory is um, allocated, and you know its exact, precise lifetime. Now, um, we'll see shortly. Every iOS app is multi-threaded. In other words, you can't build a commercial app or you can build a commercial app, but an economically viable app is one that is working very hard to not be in the main event loop. And so you will be multi-threading almost everything you do in an iOS app. Um, it implements the tightly bound MVC model. So uh, our friends in Smalltalk, they invented MVC, Model View Control. Right? And there's a fundamental assumption at the core of MVC, tightly bound, where the model and the controller are in the same memory space and everything that happens between them is fast. Our people in web world, they abuse this term. They think they do MVC. What they're really doing is on the server is model controller, and then they have a controller bridge over to a controller in their web page, which manages the view. Now, they may be compiling this down into a static page, and there may not be much communication between the two worlds. But in essence, every REST route that comes back, every post, et cetera, those are all talking to a model controller on the server. And a large part of the problems of, of web apps come because this model controller view has the internet in the middle of it. All right, it has asynchronicity, it has broken links, it has all these sort of you know, broken pipes, all sorts of bad things happen. MVC, so if you have a bad taste about web MVC, this is not web MVC. I mean, this, is, this is a very tightly bound, very fast environment. Okay, so let's talk about memory because this is, this is an important part of, of the framework. iOS OS X is not garbage collected. It's reference counted and very precisely controlled. So you see the picture of the loop over there. So here we are. We create what's called an auto-release pool. <coughs> auto-release pool captures everything that has a dynamic lifetime. It's not specifically controlled with the chain and release. Okay. In other words, almost anything returned from a function has a dynamic lifetime. Now, you know that unless it's saved, when you come back around here, it's gone. But you know that the lifetime is that it's going to last at least as long as the call stack takes to go back to the main loop. And that's what I mean by precise. Okay? All right, so in the, in the pool, the go auto-released objects go in the pool. So boom, boom, boom. All right, down here the pool's released, and release messages get sent to everything. Okay. In Swift and modern Objective-C, you will never do anything with releases and retains. You will create auto-release pools. You can create sub-pools so that you can more precisely control the lifetime of stuff in, the, in functions that you call. Okay. Um, and that becomes important if you're looping through a bunch of stuff. Um, um, most methods return auto-released objects. Um, if you need them, if you need them to have a long lifetime, you store them into the variables. Swift takes care of, of the retention and the release of these items. Um, it is not garbage collection. If something is not auto-released at the end of the end of a function, 
it is released right then and there. It is gone. It doesn't have a long lifetime. So you, you can know that if you have a large item that you're working on in a function, and you know that when you leave that function, it's gone. It's removed, reclaimed from the heap right then and there. This isn't, um, this isn't uh, generational GC. This isn't anything like that. It's like it's gone. Right, right then and there, the, the malloc alligator goes, et cetera. Is it, is it a pretty reliable um, system as in you're not gonna have references to to release memory? Because I worked with you know reference count systems in the past and, and a lot of stuff, it was fairly manual. You had to you know, count, keep the reference counts yourself and there's a lot of work in that and a lot of potential for problems. Um, you does the language hide a lot, all that? No. All of the languages hide all of that. All right. you, you, in Swift, you will never see that. Okay, The compiler works very hard so that you never see it. There are some places, and I can show you some code tonight, where you explicitly allocate C structures using a generic type called unsafe mutable pointer. And it's called out as a specific type, and there's a specific way you do it, and you have to free it, but Okay. You know what you're getting into, though. You know, you, because it has this god awful yeah, type, unsafe, it. mutable type pointer. Yeah. It's like, well, damn it. <laughs> they told you. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, ignore it. Otherwise. All right, so we're not going to do the dragging example. Um, okay, so we're in Xcode here. Okay. And so. Let's, for the time being, this is so cool. All right, done. Okay, come on. What's wrong with you? It wants Dora. It wants Dora, yeah, it does want Dora, doesn't it? All right, fantastic. Okay, so Boon is a little project that tracks where you are, all right, and stores the stuff up in the cloud using parse.com. So, um, so here we are, track capital factory. All right, this is a map object. Okay, it draws, etc. This is this code is all of this weekend old. Okay, so you know the fact that it's not polished and pretty. I guess it's kind of the point, all right? Um, all of this stuff is going up to Parse and is stored on their servers, all right? Um, I'm using their standard controls. They're just going to refresh and go up here, load more if I want. You know, all of these are sort of standard controls that Parse provides me, all right? So does everyone know what Parse is? Okay, so Parse is a, um, I'm not seeing any hands go up, so I just assume you don't, okay? Um, Parse is a mobile backend as a service. Okay, um, so let me take over here again. Chaos. Technology works. Okay. Um, Okay, so it's a mobile backend as a service. Okay, um, there's a complete set of APIs, etc. Um, okay, so this is this is it tracks active installations. I can look at the data that I've stored. And this is all up in the cloud. I have had 50, 50 fixes. Okay, um, when I did the startup crawl app, I just put everybody's raw data up there, so I knew who was sleeping with whom during, during South by Southway. So I wanted to, this time around, uh, explore using crypto. So everything up here is, is uh, AES-256 blocks going through that whole, the whole nine yards, so that, you know, I don't even know their names, I don't know their email addresses, I don't know anything about them. And I, you know, I'm basically subpoena proof. You can give me a subpoena, I give you numbers. Thank you very much. Right. I like that. I like that. Um, 
So that was part of the, but you can see, so this is all Mongo infrastructure. It's probably the largest Mongo installation on the planet, like 300,000 mobile apps talk to parse. It's a Facebook property, okay. Now, this library is an Objective-C library. Everything they do is an Objective-C. But the way Swift works is it can take Objective-C and vend it into Swift so that you have full access to cross languages. They had to do this to make it work with Cocoa and Cocoa Touch. So this is not, this is a mainstream thing. This isn't a sort of a nice to have thing. If they didn't have this working well, they couldn't <coughs> ship the app at all. They couldn't ship their, the language at all because they couldn't work with their framework. And the whole point is to make it easier to work with their framework. Um, so that's what Parse is. It's this environment. So um, let's just start to do the anatomy of, a, of an app, OK? Uh, this is startup call. Let's go look at OK. So let's look at anatomy of an app. So, um, Unlike C and Objective-C, there's no .h and .m or dot, uh, dot .c files. There's just Swift files, okay? Um, an app in, on, on iOS has a starts at the app delegate. This is the first place you get code. The framework calls you and says, okay, we finished launching. Do whatever it is you're gonna do to get started, okay? This app has a map view, which you saw, has a location view, which has the, that table view with the locations, with all the lat lawns on it. Um, it has a model, which is the, the database. These are those structures that you saw up in the, on, the, on that web page. Okay. So those are not .h like c.h, those are something else. Well, this .h and .m, these are Objective-C. Oh, okay. 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 And so what you're seeing is Swift totally works both ways. Okay. Now, could you make the models in Swift? Or it could. It, okay. Could it's young, and I tried this initially to build those models in Swift and parse, and then were slightly cranky. So the crankiness went away as soon as I redid them in in, in uh, Objective C. And you know the models are actually you know really simple. Okay. You know this one has a relation to all the locations. All right. So this isn't something that's a lot of code. Yeah, it's more of a data structure. It's a schema. Yeah. It's yeah. a schema. Okay. You know, the location that you saw, the uh, location that you saw, basically, okay, is a cipher of this JSON, the cipher text of this JSON. Okay, so this gets collapsed and all that magic stuff is done. Okay. And, you know, basically, I have cipher data, I have a hash Mac. <coughs> I, if I'm going to save image files, I've got the same thing for those. All right, so it's basically this is Objective-C, except that all it's saying is let's define an Objective-C object, not a Swift object wrapping Objective-C object. That just seemed a little bit cranky for the parse people right now. I suspect it will be totally fixed over time, but right now, as of two days ago, this was the easy answer. And as you can see, it's not terribly difficult, right? Um, for those of you who say, well, I don't want to learn any Objective-C, you're going to have to read Objective-C at the minimum because you don't have to write it, but you are going to have to look at all the examples of how the API works. Um, how many method calls do you think are in the closure environment that most of you work with? I would say it's probably under 5,000 methods and functions. Okay. There are over 20,000 methods and functions in, the, in this frame, in the Cocoa Cocoa Touch frame. Right. There's a lot of information there. When I gave, gave the uh, talk at uh, Lone Star RubyCon, on, uh, which was basically uh, Ruby Motion for using Ruby Motion to write iOS apps. Um, I gave the talk, I, sh I went through and I took Objective-C and took the semicolons off and the type information out, it pretty much compiled and became Ruby. 
and everyone was excited in the room. And then I brought out this stack of manuals. Because I'm old school and I like to print things out. I brought out this stack of manuals. That was maybe a tenth of the number of manuals you have to read and understand. And so the platform, I don't want to depress you, it's a rich, fun platform. It's also complex as hell. Okay. Um, but come on in, the water's fine. Don't, don't, I mean, seriously, you can do fun stuff. Okay. Um, so now let's, um, so let's, let's do the quick, quick, uh, quick start. All right. Um, so here's, here's where you get called. I set up my logger. I go configure the parse environment. I make my app singleton. Yeah, some of you were probably upset about singletons. I believe there is a good use for singletons for things that exist only one of. An application is for one of. There's, you know, a little network dealy bobber at the top of the screen when it's running. There's only one of those. There's things that have that a singleton is the right structure for. So I use singletons. Um, I log in and start. I then start location services. If I've been launched from the background to just do uh, location services, I say, then, then I'm done. Otherwise, I fire up the UI, okay? So without going into a whole bunch of detail, that user interface is all created in this mechanism. And so what, that, what I hope you did to see is that Coco and Coco Touch are always calling you on this main event loop. You are never in control. You know, there isn't a main for you to go do things with. Technically there is, but if you go do something there, you're, you're on your own, okay? And you shouldn't go there. You know, certainly not as a beginner. Um, but the idea is you are getting called always on this loop. And it's one time around the loop per call. They aren't calling you twice. And the reason is all of the graphic systems are coordinated through the loop. All of the networking is coordinated through the loop. Everything coordinates through this loop. And so they don't, they really don't want you to spend a lot of time on the loop. But you are always called from the loop. So you can use it as a synchronization. Okay. So, you know, when I'm doing something that is just going in, that's creating some services that are going to run in the background, I just do this. All right. And I'm doing the full UI, I come and do the rest of this code, which creates the window and the view controllers. Just to, just to make your eyes glaze over, let's go look at this function. All right. Okay, so, so this is the make root view controller. Okay, so we're gonna go make a, a map view controller, we're gonna call it locations, we're gonna set up a navigation bar. You know, just all of this, this is, iOS stuff to set up that table view that had the two tabs at the bottom and switch between the two. You know, this is not rocket science stuff, but it is detailed. Because do you want it to be black? Do you want to have um, this image? Do you want this map image underneath the map icon, underneath the map tab bar? Do you want the, um, whatever the other image was? Um, so this is where that sort of stuff is all set up. There are also some graphics environments called Interface Builder that you can draw this sort of stuff. And there are reasons to use both. And in fact, I use both in this app. We're not gonna go into that much detail in that aspect. But I wanted to see, this is, this is sort of canonical um, UI code. It looks remarkably similar to Objective-C. So if I go over here to um, Come over here to say startup crawl and look at the app delegate. Um, Are you doing the app for this year? No, I'm not doing the app for this year. Thank goodness. Um, I got out of that in the in the fall. I've done it three times. <laughs> I've written it four times. Right? So I'm, I'm like, mm, enough of this. But you can see this is uh, so here. Make root view controller. This is the Objective C, basically doing the same thing that you just saw. Okay, all right, as you can see, it's basically the same code with 
a bunch of interspersed type information that was redundant and clearly could be inferred from the framework. So, um, so let's show some interesting Swift, okay? Um, we talked a, lo a little bit about um, talked a little bit about uh, optionals. So let's go look at optionals up here. All right. So. What I'm finding is working well for me in Swift is to actually take things that might otherwise be methods and just make them functions. If they don't have act, if they don't actually use state in the object, make them a function. Um, you can make them private if you don't want them to be in a global namespace. But the idea is um, once you start making things like this functions, you can start passing them around. You can pass around methods also, but if you're not carrying state, don't encumber your functions with added with added calling overhead. It just tightens up, limits your flexibility. Okay, and we want flexibility. If we're going to use languages like this and Clojure and others, we want to be able to throw stuff around willy nilly, right? So architecture stuff, so that things fly. Um, so, um, so here's a method called encrypt data. All right, so here's an NS data item. So here you see it's, it's declared its, its local name, its type. It's going to return a tuple, NS data, NS data, but the tuple itself is optional. One question, is there any way, if, does it ever infer parameters into the function, or do you always have to specify those? You always have to specify the, the parameters in the function. But if you want to have a bunch of different flexible parameters, that's what generic types are. Right, we then define the whole family of, of variables and it's then multi-dispatch based upon type. That's what generic types are. That's one of the very common uses of generic types. Um, most people, are, there are many uses of, of non-generic situations. So in this case, I'm, I create a ciphertext tuple, which is of this type, question mark, I don't initialize it. I then go into my keychain and get my private key, so my 256 random bits for my private key. I then go in and I create a um, message authentication code. If it returns, then I go create the ciphertext. And if it returns, then I have a ciphertext tuple. And so and then and only then do I make this assignment. I clean my data, my private key up, because it's good, good crypto hygiene is you always take the secret stuff and not Nail the secret stuff out of your memory system as fast as possible. Never leave your keys around, right? That's the very first rule of good, good crypto. So deal with that, and then return the ciphertext tuple. So this tuple only is not optional, or only has something in it, if it gets through these two optional return values from this objective C code, okay? Um, so let's go take a look at, um, say, crypt with data. So I did a command click on that, so it takes me to the header. So this is straight straight C code, or straight Objective-C code. And now if I encrypt with data, um, this is basically the, the method, all right? So Objective-C and C is basic, Objective-C is C with a dynamic runtime. So you'll see these styles just become this total chaos of things. So this particular method, because I'm calling these C functions from the crypto community, they are very much about mallet blocks and free blocks and doing all of that direct pointer arithmetic directly. So for example, um, I create a random uh, initialization vector. If you don't know crypto, don't worry about it, but it's a bunch of random bits. Those have to be copied in. I adjust some sizes, boom, 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 boom. Calculations, if the result happens, if, if there is a result, in other words, it's zero if it was success, non-zero if it's not. So this is using the truthiness of C, right? Um, it, in other words, if it failed, I have to throw away my data and I'm gonna return nil. 
So this is me signaling in classic objective C fashion up the chain to, to the to the environment. And this, when it hits Swift, becomes unoptional. And so the semantics are is that okay, if this is if this is uh, if this fails, return nil. Otherwise, return an NS data item out of the C code. Right? It's really it's. Um, I'm actually quite proud of this method because it is so straight line. I mean, crypto code, you really want to be totally straight line, boring stuff, right? And so I'm really proud of that. So we back it back up. So you can basically see that I'm using the optionals to enforce some crypto properties. That this only comes out as, as a real item that I've really encrypted when I when I satisfy those two conditions and I let the optionals drive it, okay? Um, so where is this used? Okay, well let's, um, let's go, we're not gonna look for counterparts, we're gonna look for callers, okay? So this is the method that calls it. Um, it basically, it gets passed in a block of data, it then says encrypt the data, and oh, pass me back the tuple. If this tuple is not is an optional, in other words, if it isn't there, then we don't go and talk to the database. In other words, if the encryption failed for some reason, we're not gonna put this up to the database. And so I'm using the optional on this complex return type. So optionals can be, they're not just a pain in the tubus. They actually are things that let you make some very precise guarantees about the nature of your of your data items. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's that enough of that. Let me now show you um, that. This. Okay. So now what I want to do is show you some Swift. Um, um, Swift map uh, map uh, some Swift you know, dynamic map function, functional programming stuff. In Objective-C or in Coco, when you open up a new view, the very first thing you hit is this called view did load method. And one of the things that I call is make polyline in background. All right, so basically, you know, you saw that red strip that went between all the points, that's a polyline. It's based upon data that's in the cloud somewhere. So I can't make this polyline until the data has come back, or I'm blocking the UI. Do I want to block the UI? Don't want to block the UI. Blocking the UI is bad. Okay. So I have this. I have this uh, routine: make polyline in background. I go to it. Okay, it's a function. All right. Since this can get called before you've logged in, I have to check that I actually have a user. Okay. If I have a user, I'm now making a call to parse, find backgrounds, find locations in background with user. We'll go do with that. But then it's going to, I'm passing in this closure. Okay. And that closure checks to see, did I get some objects? I then do what's called a downcast. So basically, this objects here is an array of unknown type objects. I basically use this optional here to dynamically tighten it up so that I know exactly what I'm dealing with. And that optional there does the testing for me. So in other words, it will figure out, is this really what you ask it to be? And if it's not, you log an error. And then if it's not, I log an error down here. But that's me using the optional characteristic as an advantage, because this is coming back from the cloud. Who knows what comes back from the cloud? All right. And so the language is helping me manage some of those issues. So then I go create, uh, I go take these locations stored in my local stuff. And so the collection class locations has a map method. Okay. And this is a closure. And this is an initializer. For to create a map location item with dollar zero being the first parameter, right? So this is their most compact form of closure syntax. So it's inverting type for dollar dollar zero. Right. That's 
the array, it's the array and the type of dollar zero is location, because that is a typed array, type collection. Okay. So um, so here's a nice one-liner. Now, doing this in Objective C or C um, is, of course, not a one-liner. Right? Uh, C++ with the STL, it is a one-liner. Particularly, everything in C can be a one-liner. Right. Mm -hmm. But particularly now that C, C++ 11 has lambdas. Right. It does, this is possible. Um, so, you know, the, the, the roots of Lisp have infected all the languages. And Sam is so happy. But you know that is a good thing. It's a good thing we have this cross-language fertilization. It just took them 30 years to do it. 40 years actually. The McCarthy era. This was invented in the 60s, right? Um, so my map locations. We'll take a look at that quickly. But I'm adding the map locations are things that are annotations. Okay, and I'm I'm putting these are the little pins. Map locations are the little pins. Okay, and then I'm creating a polyline. If there's already a polyline, get rid of it. And then create a polyline with map locations, add it, we're off to the races. All right, so all of this has come back from find locations and background with user. So just to do a quick, so you can sort of see how multiple layers of closures this is. Okay, let's go, go in just a bit. Okay. Okay, so find location, background with user, block. The block elision syntax collapsed all of that, so you didn't even see it. It just became the curly braces, all right? So they have this the, a very complex set of rules on interpreting trailing closures, so that you can have a bunch of different syntactic things that end up being trailing closures. And so you'll see almost every method in Swift is written with this trailing closure syntax, so that you can easily just bang things on and they lay out nicely on the, on the screen. In this case, I'm calling into my relation locations and getting a query object. This is part of parse. You may not like the design. And then I say where it's less, where it created at is less than the current date. Order by descending, give me 10 of them, go find objects in background with the block. So basically, I get the query. Now I tell the query, you go over to parse and give me 10 objects. And then when you come back, call this block. So you can see we've gone down pretty deep in the rabbit hole, and we're now coming back up. And it's all, it's not so much callback hell. What it is is there's a very clear path of, you've declared what you want to have happen whenever anything, when it's all finished. Now, people might call it callback hell, um, poorly designed set of methods that use blocks definitely can become callback help. Okay. Um, the way the cocoa patterns have been developed it seems to be a lot less of a problem than I've seen in other languages. Okay. Um, so let's go back up. Um, so one other thing we wanted I wanted to talk a bit about um, classes. So this is a Swift class that's a subclass of an Objective C object and supports the annotation. It is that, has is that multiple uh, inheritance or is that uh, like inherited in interface? That's an interface. Okay. It's in, in Swift and Objective C parlance. That's an that is a protocol. Protocol. Single inheritance. Single inheritance. Multiple protocol. Yeah, you can have any protocols, but you have one inheritance. Um, because this is a Cocoa protocol, you have to inherit from NS objects. If it wasn't a Cocoa protocol, you could just be from their standard object. Okay. Um, here's an example of me using the lazy, lazy load. Okay. Is that the, the does the memoization? This is doing the memoization, and the reason I'm doing that here is. Decryption happens in there. So, in other words, I don't necessarily, until I need that data, I don't want to decrypt that block. Okay. I've also set this coordinate value. This coordinate is a variable. Um, it is in, required by MK annotation. And it basically takes my latitude and longitude from my fix, which is here, 
packages it up as a coordinate and sends it back. If there's a problem with the fix, it sends back an invalid coordinate. Okay. So this is this is a very simple class. It has a very simple initializer that just takes the location and bangs it into the slot. Okay. Um, so in reality, this probably did not need to be a class. Probably I could have faked it as a structure. But because I'm inheriting from NS object, it seemed a better thing to do it as opposed to a structure to make it a full-fledged clash. Okay. Now, well, you couldn't inherit from NS object if it was a structure, right? It would be something else. Not a but they've got all this cold, toll free bridging, weird stuff happens. Um, and, and so, it I'm still. It appears though as an NS object from elsewhere. Right. And it's not. It, I'm still a beginner at this language, too. I mean, Sounds like there's going to be some, some decent overhead with that, though. This might have less overhead. This might have less overhead. It's, it is certainly when you're talking to the rest of the fabric and this our framework and since this is getting passed across those pins the rest of the framework spends most of its time talking to this class All right so it just made sense to do that so now let's see you were talking about the um c pointer stuff so here's an example of me manipulating from swift a c data structure so polyline wants basically a structure of an array of coordinates that's what it wants, okay? So if I pass in this location, so it's gonna be the last point to the first point, or first point to the last point, okay? It goes through and says, gets my count. Notice I lock it down, because for some reason, I have to have the exact same count here for the dialloc that I had in the alloc. I wouldn't normally think you need it, but maybe they have some optimization that's happening on the stack, and they would have to know that. But since it's dynamically allocated, I... So, so the co coordinates uh, I access, that's not a bound check then? That's, that's a, you're free to corrupt your heap and all other... Off to the races, okay. dude. That's Just why... Unsafe. <laughs> yes. Okay. Unsafe. Um, in the other case, it is all checked. If it was a swift check... Sure. Just swift the standard check. array is bound check. Yeah, it's all... Yeah. It's all... They don't let you hurt yourself. Um, they don't get much in your way either, but still, this yeah. is this is how you do unsafe stuff. Yeah. And that's because MK Polyline is derived from C structure and they wanted a compact format, so you gotta create this compact format, okay? And so it's really, it's straightforward to do, not at all clear from the documentation how to do this. This took me a while to go traipsing through stuff. Um, but when you sit, once you've seen it, you know, you Google Foo, et cetera, you get enough of it. Um, here you see me using this unsafe mutable pointer as a generic type. Okay, so basically I'm saying, okay, give me a location coordinate, give me n of them. All right, so it is type, it is more type safe than a blind, blind malloc. Okay, you know, like they, they at least are checking that these are coordinates that are going across. All right, and everything's aligned and you can't really get off. Okay. You don't really have a pointer math variant, all right? So you're using basically indexing, and so you know all those pieces work. Um, you can of course do a uint eight if you want. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit And then you're off to the races there. Yeah. Okay, but you've got nice generic typing, so you may as well use it. Okay. Sure. Um, okay, so it's nine ten. Um, I could talk some more. Um, would you all like to see the the, uh, the decryption function for the location, or you all had enough? I got a long commute home, so I'd say I think you had enough. enough. <laughs> okay, we're down with the had enough. Thing. All right. Well, um, thank you very much for seeing, uh, for letting me join you, um, and. Um, Swift V1 is ready for new work, and you see I'm doing it. There's a lot of learning resources. Like the, this guy, weheartswift.com, is just a third party guy. He has this web page that basically says, okay, these are all the Swift resources. You know, you don't have to have Google Food. Go to his page, he pay, pays attention to all this stuff. People are doing uh, production work on Swift? Yes. <laughs> and our people doing production work the shipping apps now. Nice. Okay. Um, it's still rocky. It's rocking. Well, so is closer. Yeah. Um, iOS is your challenge. 
the law is going to be comparatively straightforward because all of the weird stuff you saw today was all corner case weirdness that required to just sort of work in the real world. Um, you know, I've been uh, here before. Feel free to contact me. Um, thank you. So if, if you if you want to hang around the chat downstairs in the uh, bar area is where we usually go. You can talk to other people. You can come talk to Swift. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll be here. And uh, next month we're probably going to start our seven lists and seven months series. If you have a list you want to show, talk to me or Sam, and we'll get you get you on the uh, schedule. Small talk, long talk. We'll talk more about it next month. If we don't have somebody to start us off next month, we'll do something else. Uh,